I'm Scott Lachlan. This is the Data Chronicles, and here are your data points. This is the second installment of our series regarding insider threats. I'd like to welcome three of my colleagues to the conversation, James Denville, Alicia Paller, and David Sharfstein. Thanks so much for joining me. David, maybe I can ask you to get us started here. And maybe we can start by the very beginning. How do I know whether I should kick off an insider or threat investigation? Kind of what starts an investigation in your mind and how should clients start thinking about that? Well, it's a really good question, Scott. And just for background, my practice is an investigations practice. I'm a partner in our white collar group. And in my practice, typically when I'm not dealing with wonderful colleagues like you, Scott, we are typically dealing with external investigations initiated externally through a government subpoena through an external whistleblower, through a negative article in the news. On this podcast related to insider threats, I'm reminded of a scary movie saying the call is coming from within the house. So, you know, investigations in this space are typically initiated when the company itself identifies something anomalous or something that is indicative of an insider threat situation. That can range from a number of different sources. At the more sophisticated level, with companies who have sort of mitigation, system mitigation tools in place, it could be a system triggering that an employee is transferring files from one location to another. It could be any other system triggers that might show an unusual amount of searching or accessing of particular data. And so a lot of our clients have those systems in place and an insider threat investigation can get triggered through those technological capabilities of, that a company has. It could get initiated in a less sophisticated way. Sometimes company employees report suspicious behavior of colleagues. And we've even seen instances where there are external reports from another source that an internal employee could be doing something nefarious or malicious involving company data, financial information, IP, national security information, for example. So I think the insider threat in cases are unique. There are certain things that you look for on an insider threat situation that you would not typically look for in other forms of investigations. And the key, from my perspective, as a white collar lawyer, is that the company be monitoring, right? You're not going to know that the call came from within the house if you're not checking the phone. And so, you know, most of these insider threat issues arise through vigilance, through whether the chief security officer or another compliance function within a company monitoring for suspicious activity. Dave, that's fascinating. I think one of the things that just comes out of our last conversation is just so many of the ways that insider threats can present. But let's talk about a common one that I think each of us have seen in our experience. And that is, Oftentimes in any type of workplace, you know, there are friendships that result in perhaps maybe there's situations where coworkers are not getting along and they may end up doing an adult version of tattletales, right? Or trying to get other people in trouble. How do you, in your practice, kind of see, like, if I get a complaint that a specific employee, you know, is engaged in some sort of bad action or bad activity, How do I know how legit that is? Do I always start to just kick off an investigation or do you feel like there has to be more to substantiate a claim that somebody is actually engaged in a bad activity? There are so many factors that go to weighing that issue, Scott. It is something that that comes up in a lot of workplaces. I would say that your question calls on one of the other unique aspects of an insider threat case, particularly in the example you just gave, which is I know we'll probably talk today a little bit about data preservation, how to secure evidence, but you can't always go to the person who has a claim, an allegation lodged against him or her to assess it. Because if it's true and if it's accurate, if there's any substantiation to it, you're risking the destruction of evidence. You're risking other steps being taken to avoid the company getting to the bottom of what actually happened. So as a first step, you know, weighing all the various factors, the credibility of the source who's making the allegation, what this is about the person who the allegation has been made against, and the credibility derived from independent sources of the allegation. Is it possible that what the employee reported is something that actually could have happened? If all that starts checking out, 
and this looks like a legitimate insider threat case, steps need to be taken immediately behind the scenes to preserve evidence, whether that is through backing up emails, checking company systems to make sure that routine data destruction or movement is ended, and otherwise taking the steps to do what you just suggested, which is you want something more than a basic allegation before you understand that you're in a full-fledged insider threat situation. Got it. James, maybe I can ask you to going on what Dave was saying, you know, that trigger, right, of knowing when it is that we're in a situation where something is serious versus something when it's, you know, maybe it's more benign is always a tricky concept. And let's just for the sake of conversation, kind of think about insider threats that are presenting where there is an impact to data. And there's an impact either for data being exfiltrated, data being stolen, data being misused in some way. And maybe you can talk a little bit about the role of an incident response plan, where many of our clients have developed over time to describe how they need to respond to incidents that may impact data or may impact the integrity of data, the the privacy or confidentiality, or even the security of data. How does that play out in connection with insider threats to even know whether the incident response plan is triggered? Yeah, that's a great question, Scott. So I think one of the core things to think about is what an incident response plan or set of procedures will help you do is just address the things that you've already thought about ahead of time where people are going to have defined responsibilities, you're going to have defined escalations, defined sets of communications some documentation that's help going to provide some structure around how you respond to the incident. Because I would say no matter what, if you get a report that somebody is doing something with data, I mean, maybe it's a nothing report. Maybe it's just somebody who's got some petty issue with another coworker and they want to issue a report saying, you know, James Denville is sending social security numbers out into the wild and I want you to look into what he's doing. Even if that is not occurring, even if it is just a petty complaint, you have an issue that you need to deal with internally. So having an incident response plan that is already telling you, like, how do I deal with this intake of information, whether I make the determination that, you know what, I don't believe that there's anything valid here, we're not going to do anything. To document that that was reasonable, if it turns out that maybe you made a mistake and there was something there and you need to go back and show that at the time, based on the reasonable evidence you had, you documented reasons and logged the report, closed out the report for reasonable grounds and moved on, as opposed to just having intuitive responses where it's outside of an incident response plan and you're just moving forward. The other side of where an incident response plan is helpful for any kind of incident, but particularly for data, is the moment you hear that there's an insider threat to data, you know that someone is on the inside with authorized access. And if they're doing something with one system, who knows how many other systems they may have access to, there could be a very strong inclination to just, you know, bring out the fire drill, bring out all of the emergency response units immediately, and just everyone starts running to address this huge problem, thinking that it is a huge problem. The incident response plan can sort of let everyone take a breath, something to bring out, convene the team, and have a reasoned, logical approach to it. Because you never know, people may start running off with the best of intentions, but may end up tripping up over some data privacy issues, tripping up over something, you know, starting to ask the person who's received allegations against them, as Dave was just talking about, and then all of a sudden you risk alerting the potential target of your investigation, and they start to destroy evidence, or a number of other reasons that could happen. So I think the core thing for an incident response plan and why it's good to have one in place, and it's good to test it against insider threat, is it's the type of thing where you can document your procedures so that whatever decisions you make along the way, even if it's the, we determined that this report has no validity and we've decided to take no further action for these reasons, there's accountability, there's documentation to show why it was made so that you don't have to look back on it in case you have to open it up again. And also it sets some structure for the organization to deal with the incident because there could be many different considerations. And if you've got that cross-functional diverse set of team members on the incident response team, you will avoid hopefully some of the mistakes that could happen if well-meaning individuals just start running wild trying to address the issues. And, you know, James, I think that point around that structure maybe is one I want to pause on for a second, because I think there's many good reasons to have an incident response plan to contemplate all different types of scenarios, including insider threats. 
So James, I want to spend a moment just kind of focusing on the point that you made about the importance of an incident response plan and bringing its structure to an investigation and to a potential cybersecurity event. Because one of the areas I think that is just natural for the way that you know we respond to crises is that it's very difficult to keep everything in order and to try to bring a steady and calm hand to a moment where everybody is extremely on edge. And maybe Alicia, I can ask you for your perspective and handling many different incidents for clients and guiding them through, including if they don't have that type of plan, what are the mistakes that eventually could come back and bite them in things like litigation? That is a very big question. So I think it's the stuff that we've already heard from Dave and James about. So when you don't have that plan in place, and James said, you know, then you start to all run like chickens with your heads cut off around the table trying to figure out who should do what. Or like Dave said, you might spook the wrong person by going to them with questions that you wouldn't have asked them if you'd been following a plan that was set up to be used in every insider threat investigation without knowing the circumstances. So what happens then is that if you have these personalities that are already disgruntled or rogue, and that's really how you got to this circumstance in the first place where someone took data or access data that they weren't supposed to access, you just tip everything in the wrong direction. And so how that plays out when we then see enforcement or litigation is you have a mountain of bad facts that could have been avoided, or you're missing evidence that you actually wanted to point to. Or one of my worst fears is that if evidence is not preserved, I know Dave was moving in circles around this earlier, if evidence isn't preserved, then there are sanctions that are possible. And what we see there is even a sanction where there's a presumption that whatever documents weren't preserved, but that should have been preserved, must have been harmful to the company or they would have been preserved. And that's not always the case. And so if you end up in that position, it's particularly painful to be thinking about a moment where you want to be pointing to evidence that no longer exists and you might even be sanctioned for failing to preserve that. And the sanction you're facing is that we're going to presume those documents were harmful to you when actually they would have been helpful. And so that's where even if you don't have that incident response plan in place, it's really important to take a step back, contact counsel, contact outside counsel, and get some advice about how to proceed before you start to lose evidence you want or create evidence that you don't want. I would add here to this conversation that step one, as both James and Alicia just mentioned, is you know having the well thought out and tested incident response plan and following that plan when you're put in a situation where it's called for. But as an investigations lawyer, I would also say that within that framework of an incident response plan, when there are real credible allegations of an insider threat, it's important to come up with an investigation plan, right? What are we doing in, on these particular facts, the order in which we are going to do them, and how are we going to respond within the framework of the incident response plan to identify whether we are in a situation where there's a legitimate risk to company property and information, or is it a situation where the allegations pretty quickly turn out to be either insignificant or untrue? That's a great point, Dave. I think that's one of the things that is particularly important for an insider threat investigation because of the nature of the investigation. You are looking on the inside as opposed to outside. And I think if you've got an external threat, each incident is going to be different. But for an external threat, it may very well be there's going to be a lot of commonalities around how you're going to address investigating it, partially because you've got such limited information about what an external threat could be. The potential sources of information for an insider threat are tons, potentially have, you know, employment records, all kinds of employee interviews that you could do. There may be all kinds of, you know, cybersecurity or other types of monitoring that's taking place around electronic records. And you just never know who is this person who you are investigating. If the potential target is the CEO or the head of security or the head of legal or somebody who just happens to have access to certain crown jewels or maybe just a member of custodial, so the investigation is going to be different. And another thing around this is where for an external investigation, you don't know who the individual is, who the target is. Potentially, you just know there's a person maybe associated with an IP address who's done something. 
Maybe it's the head of cybersecurity. Maybe it's a member of custodial staff. Maybe it's head of legal. Any type of person who's the insider could be the target of the investigation here. Maybe they're a well-loved employee. Maybe they're an employee that a lot of people have some grudges against. And you're going to want an investigation plan that takes those factors into account. At the risk of cutting our moderator out of this conversation entirely, (laughs) uh, James said so many interesting things there. What I would say, again, for our clients is that the incident response plan to the extent it's focused on external threats, it's almost certainly focused on sophisticated efforts by third parties to gain access to your system. An insider threat case can be simple. It could be an an employee going to the storage unit and grabbing some boxes. It can be a thumb drive inserted into a computer. It could be forwarding an email uh, from your work email to a personal email or to a third party. So, There are parts of an insider threat that require sort of a more nuanced investigation plan when there's legitimacy to the allegation. I mean, we've seen all of those examples and we see them all the time. And one thing that stuck with me from earlier, I think, James, you mentioned that sometimes the insider threat starts with something petty. But we've seen those spiral, too. And so then the person who's, I'll use an example, the medical records that some employee looked at when they shouldn't have because they were having some fight with their colleague and they looked up their medical records as part of what they wanted to talk to them about. Next thing you know, that person finds out those medical records reviewed. They tell OCR. Now there's a big problem because there's attention coming from OCR. They have much broader questions than about this incident. And so something that might have looked like a small deal at the beginning has been spiraled into something much bigger. I think all of you are making really good points. And maybe my question is for each of you, how to then define what the investigation plan is, right? Because, I mean, if we are in the position where we don't know whether it is the person who is in the janitorial service all the way up to the CEO who is engaged in a potential issue, or we don't know whether this is some sort of sophisticated compromise or whether it's more of just the kind of routine and ordinary pettiness, I would, you know, interested in your perspective is given that there's so much that we don't know, other than the fact that we know something is wrong, but we're not exactly sure who is engaged behind it or whether there's anything that's even potentially nefarious behind it. How did we find what the investigation plan is? And maybe the other half of that question is, what is our objective in connection with that plan, right? In other words, what are we trying to identify as part of our investigation that then we design a plan to hit those objectives? Well, the important thing to note about an investigation plan, particularly in a situation like this, is you're never going to be able to define, in a complicated matter, the entire investigation at the outset, right? At the outset, you need to focus on what are the next steps that need to be taken in order to try to do any number of things. Stop an active threat. Identify who the person is if that person is unknown. Corroborate specific allegations against an individual. And so it's important not to think about an investigation plan and spend sort of days worrying about all the various ways in which the investigation can unfold. If you're presented with a set of allegations from an employee, or if you identify anomalous data in a system, or if some other risk mitigation tool is triggered, right, you take whatever facts you have at that moment and think, first and foremost, if it's active, what am I doing to cut off access to that system? to prevent an employee from leaving with a briefcase full of thumb drives, whatever the case may be. And then after that, you need to continue to incrementally review the information that you're learning. It could be that the first steps you undertook as part of an investigation plan following an allegation or some other triggering event, close out the matter. It could be that you have a whale and you realize that the issues that you identified to date merely scratch the surface of a significant larger problem within the company. In which case, you know, what's important is bringing together the stakeholders who need to help you define what needs to be done, whether it be in-house or outside counsel, security officers, information security officers within the company, compliance team, HR, finance, it could be any multidisciplinary set of internal and external experts. But if you have a significant matter Make sure you get the feedback from all those relevant stakeholders and take the steps that are needed and map them out so you have an understanding of where you want to take things. 
So, Dave, you made some really good points there, including about the composition of the investigative team, which I want to get to in a moment. But before moving to that topic, I'm also interested, maybe, James, in your perspective on additional objectives for an investigation plan. Because I'm reminded that many of our clients operate in regulated spaces where impact on personal data, for example, will actually have regulatory implications. How do you think about the regulatory overhang when you're defining an insider threat strategy? Yeah, it's a great question, Scott. One of the first things that a lot of organizations will want to focus on when there's a credible insider threat allegation is who did it and what did they do and how do we stop it? But particularly if you've got personal data may be subject to European data protection laws where you may have a 72-hour notification timeframe or a financial institution which may have 72 hours or less to notify certain regulators. At the same time, you're focusing on who did this and what did they do exactly. There may need to be a focus on what data was impacted and how it was impacted. So determining what systems were impacted, what data was in there, what could have happened to the data? Did it leave the environment? Was it transferred to third parties? Do we think there was no harm? Was it encrypted? All of those sort of risk assessments that would go into helping support some reasonable determination of whether any notification obligations have been triggered, maybe to customers based on contracts. So at the same time, you've got teams out trying to figure out the log files to find out what James Denville did on the computer, you may also need to be collecting contracts, looking through the notification terms, and doing at least a high-level data review to determine the nature and scope of the data, as well as the potential impact. And Alicia, presumably you would have the same concerns from a litigation perspective, is that one of the other byproducts or objectives that you want from the investigation is to establish evidence that may end up being used in connection with eventual litigation. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the issues, though, isn't what does the evidence say, it's what evidence is missing. So ambiguities can become particularly thorny when you get all the way to litigation. And so part of that thorniness is in the moment as you're scrambling, there's an insider threat, you're trying to run everything down, you're considering your regulatory risks. Not a lot of people are thinking about the litigation risk at that point because it's too far in the future. Maybe it'll never materialize. And so to the extent you can take that step back and think about where are the ambiguities where we might in this moment actually be able to create a record that is helpful and being comfortable with the risk that maybe the record won't be helpful, but it's better to know than not know and to know in that moment where you still have room to take some more witness interviews, talk to the right people, figure out what other documents you might want to preserve that you weren't thinking about so that a couple of years down the road, if there's litigation, you're not wondering what more you could have done to fill in the gaps, figure out how those ambiguities actually could have turned into something you could work with. I would also say that top of mind, as James said, would be, you know, regulatory components of an insider threat situation. Alicia mentioned a moment ago, litigation could ensue, depending on the nature of the threat. But I would add also that there's a law enforcement component, which doesn't have to be your primary consideration at the outset of an investigation, which we're discussing today, but that our clients ought to be mindful of. In an insider threat case, the company is often the victim, right? And there's an individual perpetrator or a series of perpetrators whom may have committed violations of law, criminal law state law, federal law. But even on top of that, there's been a lot of activity lately with state-sponsored activity, telecommunications companies and government contractors related to national security issues. And there has been a wave of criminal prosecutions at you know foreign actors utilizing inside sources to obtain information. And so there is an interest in these cases, depending on what the subject matter is, what the industry sector is, and who's acting to take this information. And so, Dave, you're suggesting, right, if that is the type of fact pattern that we're seeing, that is also going to inform the investigation strategy, including the types of data evidence that we're collecting, who we're talking to, to try to present that evidence wherever it takes us to law enforcement? Absolutely. It could influence how you are acting in potential anticipation of future discussions with law enforcement. It could be on matters of national security, 
that you're going to reach out to law enforcement at the outset and try to work with them and let them try to help you identify who it is that acted. Is it state sponsored? Is it espionage? So it's a great point. I want to revisit something you mentioned a moment ago, and that was depending on the nature of the incident, the nature of the threat, that it may require a multidisciplinary approach cutting across the chief information security officer, you know, executives, HR. But even before we get there, one of the issues that I think frequently comes up for me is knowing who to trust, right? The fact that you have an insider to threat means that there is potentially somebody on the inside who is not operating consistent with the company's policies or the objectives for the company. And so as a result, you're worried that you may end up bringing somebody into the investigative team who either is part of the potential threat or may be very friendly with somebody else who's engaged in the threat. Do you have any thoughts or strategies about where to start informing that investigative team so you're getting the right knowledge without necessarily compromising the integrity of the team itself? There's a factual component of your question, Scott, which is having individuals within the company, information security officer, someone in the in-house legal department, making assessments about who are the trusted and experienced and expert internal personnel who should form the team. And that's going to depend on the facts uh, and what the allegations are and how the company is structured. But there's that structured component to this too. And, you know, some companies who perhaps have a greater risk of an insider threat, companies that have very sensitive data or just lots of data, create teams at the outset. So someone within the legal department or the chief information security officer is designated as the lead on insider threat issues. And there's a team of people who can report to him and sort of are called to action whenever there's a specific situation. And there are people whose job responsibilities include being able to assess whether it's employee behavior tools that a company puts in place, other triggering mechanisms related to data. And that group is already put in place, constituted for the purpose of having a core team insulated from various other components of the company who have the responsibility and training to look into insider threats. Also, depending on the facts, this is pretty extreme, but sometimes you could drop a non-disclosure agreement, depending on how sensitive the facts are, who it impacts, how long you think the investigation will take to really run down the key facts to make some decisions about who to talk to next. And that would at least make extra clear to the employees who are involved in the investigation that this is very serious. It needs to be discussed only among the few identified people who are part of that investigation team and that there are real consequences for taking any information outside of that team. Got it. James, from your perspective, you know, I think Dave was rattling off a few people who could potentially be logical members of the team. What do you think in terms of who those core team members are and the types of functions that need to be represented in this investigative group? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a little bit dependent on the nature of the incident, of course, particularly you're going to have likely IT security or IT in there because they're very likely going to be some electronic information that you'll either need to access or secure. So having IT security and IT involved would be key. What have resources from legal to make sure that privilege is maintained to the extent possible and that also that the appropriate legal issues are identified early on and reasonable solutions identified for those. You're likely going to want someone from human resources involved. And particularly if there's an expert in investigations on the human resources team, bring them in. There may be a need for communications to be involved early on if it looks like there's going to need to be some external or even internal communications early on because of the nature of the incident. You want communications in there. And in a lot of incidents, it's almost a good practice to bring a trusted member of communications in early, even if it doesn't look like an incident is going to warrant communications, because then if it does turn out that you do need to issue some notifications, that person has already been briefed and understands some of the sensitivities and you don't have to slow things down to bring them up to speed. 
Other participants that you may want to bring in is people from government relations. If you have people with particular relationships with relevant law enforcement, you may want to bring them in as well. But then there's also just going to be, if you may have different departments that need to be brought in, if the insider threat is located in a specific department, you may need to bring someone in from that department who's going to bring insights to understanding you know, the standard operating procedures for that business function to help out. But those are the kind of core people that you'd want looped in. And that's, again, where an incident response plan can come into play. You'll have your core incident response team and then at least contacts for the various other business functions that you may need to bring in, depending on the nature of the investigation. And if the matter merits outside assistance through your outside counsel, it is certainly possible that outside counsel will want to bring on experts to help supplement those resources for the company. It could be a cybersecurity firm who knows how to research these matters, probably at a level that exceeds the companies. And it could be private investigations firms. If you need access and research to employee behavior outside of the workplace, sometimes those groups are necessary as well. So maybe my next question is for you, Alicia. So Dave and James were mentioning that there is a whole number of folks that could be on your investigative team. And depending on the situation, depending on what the matter warrants. But my guess is, and I think in the matters that I have handled, is the investigative team usually starts pretty small and then starts to expand as more functions are needed, more information is needed. Do you have a perspective on how to expand an investigative team, the types of ways that you're documenting who's on that team? the warnings and the sensitivity that you're raising for that team, and including how do you try to protect privilege if this is an investigative that's being done at the direction of counsel? Yeah, so to protect privilege, it is always prudent to document in writing how a team is expanding. And that is easier when there is one person or maybe there are two people who know that they are in charge of that team. And to the extent others need to be brought on, they are the ones that are documenting that. If that person happens to be in-house in the legal department, even better. You know, part of the issue when we think about privilege is that if you're thinking about communications with counsel that are confidential, there's a prong about whether those communications are kept confidential. And that's where we see an issue when these teams grow to be too big. You look back years later, you're looking at documents, and it's not clear from the face of the document whether something was really intended to be privileged at the time. And so you're looking at things like how many people were on this email? How many of them were lawyers? Were the lawyers in the two bar of the email or the CC bar of the email? No one in the middle of an investigation is thinking about that. It's not the way we work. We hit reply all, maybe counsel's in the CC line, but you're really addressing counsel as the main recipient. That's not going to be clear years later. And so thinking about that when you're in the moment and you're expanding and you're memorializing, you know, we need to talk to these two other people or we need these two people to join our team. They're critical because we need to talk about these three subjects and they're the two people that could answer questions about those three subjects. That helps years down the road build out this record where it's very clear, yes, this was privileged, legal was involved. We were having these discussions to figure out what our legal risks were. We were thinking about what we needed to do next to comply with the law, whether there had been a violation of the law. And to the extent that this information was shared more broadly, it actually was still being kept confidential on what we call a need to know basis. So even if it's 20 people who are in the need to know circle six months into an investigation, instead of the four who were involved the first week, maybe they're still within that need to know sphere and documenting that can be incredibly helpful down the road. David, from your perspective, once we have developed and identified this team and the team is going to ebb and flow depending on what is needed from that group, where are they looking, right? Where is that team starting its investigation? And frankly, kind of where is the evidence? You mentioned a moment ago, not all of insider threat investigations begin as extremely large matters requiring all the various experts and individuals we've talked about on this call. So the answer to your question, it could be any number of locations. In a smaller matter that involves company systems, the company may be focused first and foremost and almost entirely on data, who accessed certain systems, what IP addresses were used to access those systems what login information was used to access those systems. So it could be very much focused on the information that a company 
has at its fingertips based on the systems that are in place that store the data that was sought to be stolen. In addition to that, you know, the locations where we often see that need to be searched for insider threat cases, it can be similar to any other internal investigation. It could be company email, the employee's email address, which should be preserved if a target is identified. It could be on cell phones, text messages, personal email. And on that point, it's always worth noting that the company's access to phones is very dependent on whether it's a company phone or a company plan or the employee's personal phone with access to company email. It could be in surveillance footage within a company. If this is literally physical access or someone who came in after everyone else left, it could be external sources like social media. There are a variety of different places, particularly when you're trying to identify who could have committed the insider threat violation or action that you could search. And Alicia, you had mentioned the point earlier, right? It's really important in the event of litigation that all of the information that Dave was mentioning is preserved. Do you have any strategies about how to do that, given that the nature of the information and the nature of the investigation can change the types of things that you're looking for and looking at and the systems and the databases and the document repositories that you're searching? Sure. So it's helpful to have a preservation notice, or sometimes we call it a litigation hold in place early on, especially if you think there's a risk of litigation, whether it's coming from a rogue employee, or you think you might have to litigate against an employee, or you think that there's a threat of litigation by folks whose data was impacted. There are numerous ways this stands out. And so when you're thinking about the litigation hold, there are a few different buckets in my mind. Some of the language is boilerplate. You want it to be incredibly broad in terms of describing to people who are unfamiliar with this type of notice what they should be preserving. So all sorts of documents and communications. As Dave said, it could be communications on your work phone, could be on your cell phone, could be on your computer, could be your daily planner that you keep in hard copy on your desk. And so making sure that that's all very clearly spelled out in the notice is very important. Then the second bucket in my mind is the description of the types of documents to hold on to. So the topics that are important, that's something that should be memorialized early on, but it's really helpful to revisit that a few weeks or even a few months down the road. And especially if you're still looking into this years later, because then there is litigation, dust off that notice, take a look again at those topics and see what else are you thinking about now that you weren't thinking about when you initially sent this notice around. The third bucket is the list of custodians. So who is going to receive this notice? And that often changes and needs to be updated more frequently, even on the topics at issue, because as the investigation unfolds, you're becoming aware of different people who might have information that's important. And again, you don't want to get to a spot where you didn't preserve something you should have. You want to be able to point to it and you can't because it doesn't exist anymore. And even worse, you get to a spot where you could potentially face sanctions because documents don't exist that used to. Even if they were not harmful, they could be deemed harmful by a court. And so having that notice in place and thinking about the type of language that you need in there to protect yourself is very important. Well, that's maybe a great place for us to pause today's meeting. This is just the second in the multiple set of a series that we are going to be having on insider threats in particular. We're going to explore, I think, in more detail in future episodes, you know, the issues surrounding privilege, including how to think about that from a U.S. perspective and from a non-U.S. perspective. And a number of the areas that I think the panelists pointed out, everything from the regulatory overhang to the threat of litigation to law enforcement. And I really appreciate everybody's engagement and participation on this panel. It was a great discussion. We hope that you will join us for our next episode, where we will discuss how to conduct an insider threat. There's actually going to be three components of this in three different episodes. We're going to cover the U.S. perspective on how to conduct an insider threat investigation. Then we'll turn over to the EU. And then finally, in China, don't miss any one of them. They will be terrific. With that, I'm Scott Lachlan. This is the Data Chronicles, and those are your data points. Data Points.